Thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I am joined today by Miles Vining from SEAL Report. Uh, you guys are kind of out and about doing first-hand on-the-ground research on small arms in Middle East, North Africa, Central Asia, all sorts of exciting vacation spots, right? We try to, um, yeah. from the whole team, from, you know, Adham, Haracha, Matthew Moss, Omar, you know, Yol, uh, Marwan. Um, we make it work, and we have a really fun time doing it. Matthew Moss seems to be the name that doesn't fit in there. <laughs> all the, yeah, all those Arabic and Armenian names. Just kidding with yeah. you, Matthew. Anyway, uh, the reason we're out here today is we have a couple of Tabuk rifles, and this is the Iraqi version of the AK. Now, uh, it wasn't domestically designed in Iraq, but these were made in Iraq. So, uh, what's the basis? Where did this originally actually come from? So, Tabuk production starts in 1980, and it comes from the Yugoslavian-Iraqi relationship and military-industrial relationship, where Yugoslavia actually set up um, Iraqi small arms production um, back in 1980 and before, in the late 1970s. We have a number of uh, actual Yugoslav um, M70AB uh, rifle contracts for the Iraqi army, so we actually have Yugoslavian rifles in use by the Iraqi army. However, you know, the Saddam wanted his own uh, defense industry, making his own small arms. Sure. Everything from uh, Tariqs to RPGs, um, and Iraqi industry covers a wide breadth. They're, you know, the Iraqis made in the Al Qadisi establishment south of Baghdad. They made uh, binoculars and ammunition, all the way up to missiles and launchers. Okay. Um, so it's a wide array. Anyways, the Tabuk production. We at the beginning of the at the beginning of the Tabuk production, which you know, the, even the name Tabuk, Saddam took the name from an early Islamic battle, um, and it was part of what his his sort of strategy, his statesmanship strategy, and naming uh, small arms and events after events or people in early Islamic history and in recent times because um, he's trying to gain that support as you know a guardian of the Arab cause a guardian of the Palestinian cause that's what that comes yeah, he from. wants to connect himself to this 1500 year tradition exactly that makes sense okay so to book um, early to books we see a lot of Yugoslav influence in terms of a lot of number of components that are from Yugoslavia and that are incorporated into Iraqi designs. We can tell the difference with some of them, but not with all of them. So we should point out that fundamentally the, the Yugoslav M70 is one of the most distinctive AKM pattern rifles out there because they changed a lot of things in Yugoslavia compared to Chinese, Russian, Polish, Romanian production. They have rear trunnions, uh, the butt stocks are held in in a completely different way. Um, they have the grenade launcher sight and gas cutoff. So when you flip that up, it's a sight, but it also cuts off the gas system uh, so that you're not trying, you know, you're not slamming the bolt back with the power of a grenade launching blank. Um, yep, they have the little locking button so that your dust cover doesn't come flying off when you launch a rifle grenade. Mm -hmm. uh, the handguards are distinctive. Um, you know, like there's a lot of distinctive elements to a Yugoslav AK, and that's what the Iraqis, having licensed that, that's what they were producing. Correct. Um, and then within that licensed production at the beginning, we see a lot of Yugoslav components get in, um, Yugoslav grips, Yugoslav magazines that a lot of people misattribute to as the Triangle Witness Soul Iraqi magazines. Mm. So they're actually from Yugoslavia because we've seen those magazines come out of Yugoslavia to the United States. Very few of them actually exist in Iraq today. Yeah. Um, you know, I've only come across one Triangular Witness Soul magazine in Iraq or at, you know, thousands, you know, hundreds of the magazines I've looked over. Then grips, we have differences between Yugoslav grips and Tavuk Iraqi grips. There's a difference there in some of the details. But that's um, a really subtle difference. I mean, this yeah. looks like a Yugoslav grip, which is another distinctive element of theirs, but just little changes in the serrations and the toe and this round molding mark on the top, identify these as specifically Iraqi instead of Yugoslav. Exactly. Okay. Um, and then on, you know, on the uh, grenade launcher uh, rifle, rifle grenade sight, we have two books with Yugoslav sights on them that are marked um, in in, uh, in English letters, uh, K and D or D and K or something there. But then on the Iraqi version, we have Dol and Sheen, and Dol being for the Bia, which means tank in Arabic, and then Sheen being for um, uh, a pr a personnel or anti-personnel for um, she uh, Shezel or something like that. Okay. Okay. I forget the word right now. So a combination of probably, I mean, it makes sense that when they're setting up production at the, the Iraqi factory, this is done with Yugoslav, substantial Yugoslav technical assistance. And so it's not uncommon, like we see it with Bulgarian mm -hmm. AKs, as the Bulgarians are setting up production right off the bat, they can't make every part. So they bring in some parts from Russia and you'll find early Bulgarian guns built on Russian receivers. Probably the same thing happened here. What, you know, al Qadisiyah was able to make half of the bits they brought in the rest from Yugoslavia as they needed them so they could assemble and you know, complete 
full rifles. Yeah, and then, you know, this extends also to Iraqi handgun production, the Targ. There's Italian Targs, there's Iraqi Targs, with the Baby Tabuk, which is a Krinkov variant of the Tabuk, mm -hmm. you know, shortened stock, shortened barrel. Um, the handguards on the Baby Tabuk aren't wooden Iraqi handguards. They're actually Bulgarian huh. um, laminate or polymer, whatever they used, um, but they're actually cut in half to fit in here and you actually can identify them because they're actually mismatched huh. and the holes don't line up and you can see that on the oh, standard funny. baby to books and also the uh, gold painted baby to books as well huh. okay hmm. so now we know there's a huge variety in to books and i think that's something that a lot of people don't recognize is you look at a lot of people would look at this and say ah that is a to book it's a yugo m70ab but in reality we're, we see or you see because you're the one actually out there <laughs> looking to books that have uh this the uh, the bulged front trunnion that we kind of expect of Yugoslav guns, but also ones that have smooth front trunnions mm -hmm. with and without the grenade launcher systems. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes Yugoslav grips, sometimes Iraqi grips, sometimes Chinese grips. Mm -hmm. The markings, like on this one, you've got Arabic markings on one side and English markings on the other. But sometimes you get only one of the two. Sometimes it's just English on the right. left side. And that's, you know, if you want to call it maybe an export model from the 1990s, we see examples such as that. And even serial number ranges don't match up there. Okay. And, you know, going into, but yeah, no, there's a wide variety. And even with, you know, so it begs the question, what is a standard to book? And the answer is, I don't know. Right, there kind of isn't one. Yeah, there's this, and a lot of them are like this, but there's also a lot that are not like this at all. Well, so a lot of people would say, okay, the standard's gonna be the one that they made the most of. Yeah. And most of them were in somewhat of this guise. Okay. You know, I can we can roundabout say this is most about it, but there's also a lot of variety in the person. But how many did they make? I've seen literature that says eight and a half million. Because they've got seven digit serial numbers that go up to like eight, five bunch of numbers. Yeah, and then so that gets into we don't actually know how many to books were, were produced. That number is kind of misconstrued because just because the serial number goes up to that range, it doesn't mean there are many that many to books. Okay. And again, going back to more misconceptions of, you know, the Tabuk was the standard service arm of the Iraqi army, um, we know that not to be the fact. We know there were not enough to books that outfitted, that were made to outfit the entire Iraqi army, and there were never enough to books um, that even existed in the Iraqi army to, in reality. We know from accounts and interviews with Iraqi army veterans from the you know, Iran-Iraq War, 1990s Gulf War era, um, asking, you know, what, what was your service rifle? You know, it was a Polish AK, or it was a Chinese Type 56, or whatever. Um, the, the books did exist. Um, they are most likely in the Republican Guard. They were using some other infantry units. Um, however, they didn't exist to the extent that I think is in popular conception of what they existed as. You would kind of expect it's an Iraqi-made rifle, mm -hmm. AK even. The We know the Iraqi army used AKs because mm -hmm. we see that. Uh, if they're making them, obviously they're going to equip their own forces with them. But in reality, it was more like a status symbol for Saddam than a primary armament for the army. Exactly. It's probably a lot cheaper just to go <laughs> buy surplus Polish, Chinese, Russian, yeah. whatever AKs. And we see that, you know, even at the Marine Corps Museum, the amount of AKs in there that are captured from the first Gulf War, the majority of them are not to books. They have three or four to books, different variants, but the majority of them are Chinese, Hungarian, Polish, Russian, um, et cetera. Okay. Um, uh, examples. They aren't They aren't these, you know, uh, Iraqi to books. Okay. So. Now they do also have underfolders. Yeah. That's a pretty common pattern. We've got one of those we'll do a little bit of shooting with today. But then we've got this really distinctive thing, a to book sniper, mm -hmm. which is kind of a, like no one else really did this because they've got this really, you know, easily discernible cutout stock. The long barrel and the flash hider look like a Yugo M76 mm -hmm. or maybe an R, um, a PSL, but the action is still in 7.62x39. It's the, the act, yeah, the, the operating mechanisms are identical between right. these two. They just stuck a different stock and a longer barrel and a scope rail because the standard ones don't generally have scope rails. And the RPK rear sight too. Oh, so they did. Yeah. yeah. A windage adjustable rear sight. Yeah. So this has, I believe it's a Romanian copy of a PSO scope, which was used. Russian PSOs were used, but it appears that most of them were actually Xerox uh, four power, the same scopes that were on the Yugo N76. Yeah, the black, very distinctive type. Yeah. And we've seen that in the catalogs that exist, um, and also in examples for sale in the Iraqi gun markets today that we catalog and we look at that stuff. So, okay. um, yeah. Now, there's one other element here that I want to touch on before we start shooting, and I am kind of anxious to actually put some rounds down range with these, but mm -hmm. the serial numbers on the two books yeah. are seven digits long, mm -hmm. but you were telling me before we started filming, the first three digits are like a lot code, mm -hmm. and the last four digits are the actual sequential serial numbers. From that lot code. Right. right? So, it, yeah, so you can't, you know, as we were saying earlier, you can't 
that serial number, you know, this is a reproduction, you know, of 1025978. This does not mean this is the 120, you know, one million, million right. you know, version. No, it doesn't mean that at all. So that's lot 102. Yes. This one, the first three digits are 423. Exactly. Lot 423. And those numbers kind of sort of correlate to production years, but not really. And we know this by looking at all the data of the books we've seen in museums and collections um, in markets in Iraq and stuff like that. Um, and we know this because looking at the year codes, luckily they did put the year right. or else it's, we'd be totally lost. Yeah, it's just dated on, you know, this is 2002. That one's what, 80? 1982. 1982. Yeah. So. so we see, you know, first, the earliest one we've seen is 1980. The last one we've seen is 2003 on the, the book Snipers. Okay. But then we have, you know, and this was done across Iraqi small arms. Tariqs. Every Tariq begins with the lot 313. And then you have Quds Tariqs, that is 0313. And then you have um, 765 Tariqs that are a different lot number. And the same thing on here. So we know, you know, the trainers were in the 104 range, but sometimes 133. We know the standard rifles were in different configurations there. But we know this because within the same configuration pattern of rifle, we see different years that those patterns were produced in, and then we see the same lot numbers across the years. Okay. So I can point to, you know, two Tabuk rifles, maybe one's an underfolder, maybe one's a fixed stock, and both and one the underfolder is like 202, and then the fixed stock is like, you know, 405, whatever, um, and they're in different year ranges, and they go back on each other. So you'll have same lot number, different years. So okay. it, it's indicative of, you know, they made it within that pattern and batch and stuff like that, and not, you know, starting from zero to up. The lot numbers did progress. You do see um, lot numbers in the 1990s that are in the 700, 800 series, and that's where some people get the 8 million um, to book uh, production figure from. However, you also see Al-Qadassia rifles that are in the 500 series that are being made up into 2003. Hmm. So, you know, that the Qadassia was a 500 lot range. Whether the Qadassia is made in the early 1990s or made in 2003, that was its assigned, um, you know, space within okay. the small arms um, serial numbers. Like, I, I almost wonder if, you know, so we know there's some data encoded in those three-digit lot numbers. I wonder if maybe um, client, you know, who are we making this for? Because these were made sporadically in relatively small numbers. So it's like, oh, we want to make that one for export to Elbonia. We need to make these because this division of the Republican Guard needs some more guns, and they specifically want grenade launchers and underfolders. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, so we there's no real data because like, all these records got destroyed in the destroyed, the lost, War. confiscated, stolen in 2003 during the invasion. You know, the entire Cudahy establishment was stripped okay. of everything. Looters came in. Um, even looters even got to it before the U.S. military got to some of it. Um, Enterprising. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, the data, a lot of the data just isn't there, yeah. and we have to gather it from little specks all over. It's like mm -hmm. Arasaka's. Yeah, yeah. All the data on Arasaka's is destroyed, basically, but collectors have been able to piece together the story from looking at surviving guns. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, one more question for you. Mm -hmm. We have some Arabic markings. Yep. So on the on the right side, it says Tabuk, yeah. caliber 762 by 39 millimeter. What's this on the, the left side? So yeah, on the left side, you have in Arabic, it says Tabuk, um, which is the Islamic battle um, in, the early, in the early stages of the invasion. Um, and then you have Ayare, which is caliber in Arabic, and then you simply have 7.62 7 by 39, also in um, Eastern Arabic numerals, and then millimeter, which is mim la mim, so millimeter in there for them. Okay. For now, I think we should actually put some rounds through these. Let's see what that one's like to shoot. Let's see what this one can do on paper, and I'll get to it. Cool, let's do it. Sounds good. And on the two rivers, there's a semi and a full, but this is just semi for both. On the markings here, you've got uh, uh, elf for aman, for safe. Then you've got seen in Arabic for salle, for um, full auto. And then m for mufrad, for a uh, uh, semi. Okay, so. That's the night sight. the target went down. Oh, you killed it already. All right, now I'm going to make this gun safe. 
and there's no round in the chamber, which is characteristic of a Yugo M70AB. But I have a fully loaded magazine, and I just ejected the round that I was about to shoot and was in the chamber, and now I have an empty chamber. So, yeah, so normally the ejector is located far enough back that if you put it on safe and rack the bolt, the round comes out and then goes right back into the chamber. But on the Yugos and the Tabuks, the ejector's just a little further forward. That's a really neat trick that I think a lot of people don't realize. Yeah, so I mean, if we wanna, wanna show this again, fully loaded magazine, yep. okay, just to break it down. Magazine is now inserted. I, okay, so when I'm on safe, I cannot chamber around. Of course I can't chamber around, it's unsafe. But now I go to full auto in this case, and go back, and go forward, I have a round in the chamber, yep. ready to go. I put it on safe. The idea is maybe I get off my patrol or you know, I'm back in a garrison environment, I wanna make the rifle safe without taking the safety selector off. So I have my, remember I have my round in the chamber, I eject the round in the chamber, and the bolt won't go back far enough to pick up a new round. So I cannot put the next round in in the magazine. Thus making, just reducing the, the weapons condition from a condition three state to, you know, well now we're in a condition three state before we were in a condition one state, so. All right, my turn. I have also never fired a Tabuk, although I have fired one of these Yugo uh, fixed stock M70s. I think they are fantastic AK patterns. Miles is a better shot than I am. There we go. So there's not really a huge surprise that you're gonna get shooting a Taboo, because it's gonna shoot like a Yugo M70, which shoots much like other AKs, but it is a real nice, solid pattern. They're accurate, they're reliable. These are really good guns. Accurate, he says, and then misses twice. Yeah. All right, Miles, you want to try the underfolder? Yeah, sure. All right, so here we are with the underfolder. Um, now, since this is rifle grenade equipped, you brought the rifle grenade, right? Absolutely, I've got a whole case of them in the car. All you right. AP or AT? Can we do a little bit of both? <laughs> okay, here we go. So, this is the Tabuk underfolder, safe. This one was just freshly built. Um, so the other one was well worn in. We'll see how this goes. So you kind of knocked the target down <laughs> and make it really hard to hit it now. Yeah. hook you up with another magazine here. All right. If I adjust it. What right. that? You are actually in the vague vicinity of the target. Uh, generally, right? Milk jug group, right? Or car size group. <laughs> All right, so what do you think about the underfolder? Um, I mean, it, it does its role as this classical gun, but I mean, in terms of accuracy, in terms of, well, accuracy is different, but it's just, it's an underfolder. It's uncomfortable to shoot, like I any hate underfolder. Underfolders. Huh? I hate underfolders. Yeah. Just dick. I mean, <laughs> not ideal. Okay. Not ideal. You know what? So. I'm going to skip past that one, and I'm going to take a turn now with the sniper. All right. Some precision shooting. All right. So first off, the sharp-eyed among you will have noticed that I am wearing a Syrian beret, and that is because the only Iraqi one I had is actually too small for me, and Miles is wearing it. And Sirius like the next closest thing I had and it fit so now um, go ahead and put five rounds in 
I actually don't really care for the cheek rest. I think this brings my head up a little like uncomfortably high on the stock. So I'm gonna use, I'm gonna go without it. Also pull that off. This, by the way, is a Romanian copy of a PSO scope. I think probably the most common scope used on these was actually either the Yugoslav uh, Zrak, um, the scope for the Yugo M76, or an Iraqi-made clone from al -Qadisiya. Miles, you said al made optics. Yeah, we have binoculars that were made by al so the, the ability for al to make optical devices was definitely there. Okay. Um, whether they copied the Yugo scope or not, or just bought the Yugo scopes, um, is, is to be debated. But the majority of the, the book snipers that we've been looking at have that uh, Zorak, uh, very distinctive black scope on it. Yeah. All right, let's get you five rounds. Cool. So I'm going ahead with the uh, cheek rest on. Um, shooter's preference, I feel a little bit better, and that's, you know, that's built into the design, having this be able to be removed. For shooters like Ian, who found it uncomfortable, I find it... Uh, placing my head in the correct position, but that's due to my own preference and body mechanics. Um, this actual cheek rest is on the Iraqi al qadisiya which is a Dragunov attempt actually using an al quds RPK receiver um, to clone it. And it's a similar cheek, cheek rest as the al qadisiyas but it's not the same. They're not interchangeable. They're made to different widths of wood on it. So, not fantastic, not terrible, uh, given the limitations of our ammunition, which is, by the way, old lacquered steel case wolf, not too bad. I had about a three minute elevation spread. Miles, you had just more than that at about four, but windage wise, we were both equally not fantastic. It's almost like it, it did the same thing. Three tight on the left and then two loose on the right. Yeah, I don't know if that's, I don't know if we can take any statistical meaning from yeah. that, but yeah. uh, you know, it's interesting, you told me that Iraq made a ton of 7.62x39 ammo, and it was all brass cased. Yes, Iraq, Syria, and Iran all made brass 7.62x39. Um, and you know, we're used to the steel case stuff in the US, and that's just because of the US market and the economy just wanted the cheapest can get. But over there, a lot of it's brass. Um, and that was going back to the 1980s and 90s and early 2000s. And today, Syria still makes brass cased ammo. I wonder if their ammo was any more consistent and more precise or more accurate than uh, than the Russian stuff we were using today. It's a good point because we're using like bottom of the barrel stuff in the US and that gives you a false, you know, you almost wonder, it's like, yeah, the AKs have this reputation for bad accuracy in the United States, but is that actually the case given better ammunition? Which uh, overall ammunition is some of the, is one of the cheapest um, investments you can make to make any weapon system more right. accurate and precise. It's also a little surprising to me that they didn't put any sort of bipod on the Tavuk snipers. No. But they never did. No. And well, I mean, going back to the SVD and the Dragunov, you know, there's no, I think it was, came down to as a squad level marksman. They wanted, they wanted the guys to probably be more mobile, more maneuverable, running around with it, as opposed to setting down in a position such okay. as the case with an SVD, right? Yeah. Oh. All right. Whew. All right. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. That was a fun chance to shoot some Tavuks. Now, I'd like to give a big thanks to Miles uh, for coming out here to help with this. 
Uh, Miles and Sela Report do a ton of firsthand, on the ground, in the hot of the action reporting on small arms, basically small arms research. It's the sort of thing that a lot of the, like even major NGOs don't try and do this sort of stuff. And these guys are small enough and flexible enough to be, to be right there at when stuff's going down. So if you're interested in modern conflict small arms research, absolutely consider uh, supporting Sela Report. They're on Patreon. Uh, where else can people find you? Uh, the website, uh, sealareport.com, that's where all our articles and stuff are. We have podcasts up on SoundCloud, um, also social media, Instagram, Twitter, um, and Facebook as well. All right, awesome. Mm. I do also want to give a big thanks again to Two Rivers Arms uh, for loaning us a couple of cool Taboot clones uh, to do some shooting with today. So if you're interested in something like this, of course, basically no real Tabooks came back into the U.S. because they're all machine guns and soldiers can't bring that sort of thing home as souvenirs anymore. Uh, but you can check them out at their website for their clones. I can't give you their website. Thank you, YouTube. But it's Two Rivers Arms. You can find it pretty easily. So big thanks to them. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching. And thanks, guys. And thank you again from the entire team at Cell Report. My pleasure.